Well, for this chat, I thought we would have it here in this part of the studio because it was a little more Blade Runner-like. In looking at the other tech channels, I find that every single one of them has done their obligatory let's guess what the new Tesla pickup truck will look like video. And so we're going to go ahead and do the exact same thing, but a little differently. And so set your Penfield mood organ to 481 and let's take a look at what the Tesla pickup truck will really look like. We're going to go ahead and examine this from the position of a design and engineering exercise. Now we have a great leg up on all of those that have done this before and come up with some fantastic renderings in that there's been a lot that's been said about the truck and now we're able to then take all of that information and then stack it up and see what we can build out of that information. So what we're going to do is we're going to pretend that these don't exist on the truck yet, but that they exist as a series of engineering requirements. And so then what we're going to do is we're going to walk through step by step the process of actually designing a truck that fits all the criteria that we already know the truck has because those are things that Elon Musk has told us that the truck has. So. Let's go ahead and go through these one by one, and then we will, like I said, group them together and see if we can make some sense of them. So uh, something out of Blade Runner, that it's going to be a cyberpunk design, that it can't look like a normal truck, but more like something uh, resembling an armored personnel carrier. Uh, and then we get into some serious engineering specifications. It has to be a better truck than a Ford F-150, and it has to be a better sports car than a 911. It's got to have a 500 mile range. It has to fit six people with one of them being as big as Andre the Giant. And then eight, it has to have a strong cabin and drivetrain that is water resistant and has uh, uh, the ability to uh, seal itself from the uh, outside environment. And it should be so much so that it would actually float. And so then the last is, is that it should have a pulling capacity of 300,000 pounds. And then finally, that it should have a starting price point at under $50,000. So there we have our engineering mandate. Like I said, this isn't going to be like other channels where you've seen renderings and that kind of a thing and people discuss uh, why they did a rendering a specific way. This is actually going to involve all of you. What we're going to do is we're going to take this engineering mandate, we're going to go ahead and go through things step by step, and then we're going to open up the comment section so that all of you can discuss the merits of all the things that we have presented and then I'd like you to present your own designs and then we'll go ahead and see how closely those match up with what is ultimately released on the 21st of this month. It's going to be quite an interesting reveal I think. So let's go ahead and start attacking these engineering mandates. So the first three they're not so much engineering mandates as they are design requirements. And so they don't directly affect the engineering, but they do indirectly reflect it. They're going to dictate things like where the doors are, how the vehicle is used, that type of a thing. So we'll go ahead and uh, chew away at those first three. What the hell does that even mean? Something out of Blade Runner, a cyberpunk design. Uh, it can't look like a normal truck. It's going to look like uh, a, an armored personnel carrier. What, what, all, what does that even mean? So let's go ahead and pull up this screenshot from Blade Runner where J.F. Sebastian arrives at, back at his home. Enhanced 5078. 
And so here you see the driver sitting in a forward pod. Now this also matches what we know of Tesla's design language from the semi, where it was important to them to have the driver sit forward of the vehicle slightly, forward uh, uh, in the cab, so that you had a more commanding view of everything that goes on uh, uh, around you. Center and stop. Enhance 48 to 45. And here we see the side door entry. Now this also matches with the design language that we've seen from the Tesla Semi. So now let's go ahead and with that in mind, let's go ahead and take a look at the only rendering that we actually have so far from Tesla's own design group. Given what we've seen in the past from the pickup truck that was designed off of the Semi platform, we can probably say that a central seating position and a side entry, possibly both sides, uh, is a foregone conclusion. I would be very surprised if they uh, released the truck without those features. Now, you'd think that those were uh, outlandish or outrageous engineering decisions, but in reality, they're not that strange. When you start thinking of this in terms of the problems that that solves, as opposed to just doing it because you were told to do it that way, then we can start to look at one of the cost-saving issues that come immediately to mind, and that is, is that you don't have to reconfigure this truck to be able to be used in either the UK Australia or Japan, so long as you don't justify the cab to one side or the other like we saw in that image of JF Sebastian's van. Now the UK might pose a slight additional issue in that the roads in the UK are fairly narrow and so if you do a full-size truck already there's going to be some restrictions as far as, as where you can, can drive it, but from a manufacturing standpoint now we're no longer talking about having to manufacture a separate vehicle for right or left hand drive. Now, that brings up the one other issue, and that is that if you do put the seating position in the center, that it can be difficult to get in and out of the vehicle. And one major reason why people buy trucks, at least in the US, is because they don't fit really well in a standard vehicle. Could be because of size, it could be because of mobility issues or what have you. And so being able to get in and out of that seat is going to be a major concern. And for that reason, I think that they're going to be using a swiveling captain's seat so that the seat will be able to turn all the way facing the rear of the vehicle so that you can easily get out. So obviously we don't, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves too much because we're going to be coming back to the size issue a little bit later, but that would also help explain how we'll be able to get a larger individual into uh, that uh, center seat. And so now with that, we'll go ahead and move on to a couple of the other more serious engineering constraints with the truck. And that is that we now have two things that seem like they're diametrically opposed to one another. And that is that we have to make it look like a truck and make it outperform a uh, Ford F-150, yet we also need to be able to have it perform at least in some aspects as well as a Porsche 911. So now we have to pay some serious attention to the physical size of the truck. So obviously this isn't happening. Though it is true that when it comes to trucks, size does matter. The size of the truck actually ultimately comes down to what it is you're trying to do with it. And so for the purpose of designing this truck, we're going to assume that what you're trying to do with it is work. And when you're doing that as opposed to some lifestyle element, whether that's using it as a show truck or using it to haul a fifth wheel, uh, there are some different criteria that, that come into play as to whether or not it's better or worse than its competition. And so what we're going to do is we're going to assume that this truck is being used for work. Now with that said, 
let's go ahead and take a look at the minimum and maximum size of a truck that's used for that. And so here you can see this idiot's helped us out uh, by uh, showing us what the maximum size of such a truck would be. And the maximum size is actually, as you see here, dictated by whether or not it will fit into a supercharger stall. If this truck can't fit into a supercharger stall, it's useless. They're not going to be able to sell any of them. They, so th this gives us a really good idea of what would be the maximum size of such a truck. Now, when we're talking about the minimum size, it's a work truck. And one of our major design criteria is that it has to be a better work truck than a Ford F-150. And in order for it to be as good as a Ford F-150, the bed has to be able to fit a piece of plywood or drywall that is four foot by eight foot. If it can't, then it is not a better truck than a Ford F-150. It is a worse truck than the Ford F-150. And so this gives us our minimum and maximum size to work with um, when we're talking about about the truck. It's got to fit into a supercharger stall and you have to be able to fit an eight-foot piece of plywood into the uh, uh, into the back of it. I don't believe that those two design criteria are negotiable in any way. Now we're on to the really tough one. How do we make this thing a better truck than a Ford F-150 and still make it a better sports car than a Porsche 911. Uh, I don't think we do. This is a real head scratcher and I welcome anything that you guys have to say in regards to this in the comment section. Maybe I have the size wrong. Maybe there is some wiggle room as far as still being able to fit a full size sheet of plywood into the thing and still making it smaller than what I'm imagining. So by all means, let me uh, let me know in the comment section. Let everybody else know what uh, what your thoughts are on that. My thought on this is that they don't mean handling. That though it will handle fairly well, and I think that this will be a truck that will be as tall as a van, you'll probably be able to stand up in it or nearly stand up in it. Uh, again, that would go hand in hand with the side door. But uh, I think that uh, it will handle a, a, decently well because obviously the batteries will be fairly low in the in the vehicle compared to what's above it in cab, but I just don't see it going around an autocross faster than a Porsche 911. I just don't. But I do see it out accelerating a Porsche 911. Now we'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk about the fact that it, it's going to have a 300,000 pound pulling capacity. If you design anything with a 300,000 pound pulling capacity, then you're going to be able to really put some serious power to the road. And so if we think of it in terms of this massive things zero to 60 time, then I think that we're on to something as far as the performance comparison be, be, between the two. And so I think for at least right now, we'll go ahead and leave it at that. I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys have to say in the uh, comment section. But now we're on to the next easy one, which is a 500 mile range. Give it a 200 kilowatt hour battery. That was easy. So I think it will have a 200 kilowatt hour battery and I'll go even further than that and I'll go out on a limb and say that it will have the exact same battery as they're developing for the Tesla Roadster. I don't see any reason why we would think that one wouldn't be able to cross over to uh, uh, to the other one. So I think that that's uh, a, a pretty much an easy uh, conclusion. And so then Fit six, and one of them should be the size of Andre the Giant. Well, again, let's go back to uh, this idiot parked in the supercharger stall and take another close look at uh, that truck. So, how do we get one person, how do we get it to fit, fit, fit six people and have one of those people be the size of Andre the Giant? Well, you put the driver in the middle and you put him up where the motor used to be. And so I think that that's certainly one way that we can solve that issue as far as the one 
person being larger. And so now here you'll see in this quick Photoshop mock-up, this is what that cab would look like. And the person that you see seated in there, that would be in one of the side seats next to the, uh, uh, next to the driver's seat, which would be in the center and slightly farther forward than that person shown. And then obviously in the back, you have a side egress door, possibly one off of either side of the vehicle. And then you'll have a bench seat along the back to, uh, um, to be able to seat the other three people. And so I think that that's a pretty reasonable approximation of what the uh, seating capacity is going to look like. Uh, and again, I look forward to hearing whether you guys think that, uh, that that's on the mark or uh, hearing what your alternatives are, especially if you're thinking that the vehicle will be somewhat smaller. Uh, I think that that will be also interesting to uh, uh, hear the, the arguments uh, uh, for and against that. And then number eight, we're looking at the ability to seal up the passenger compartment uh, against water ingress and also uh, to uh, have it airtight probably for dust and smog and that type of uh, uh, that type of a thing they've obviously done that with the model x and uh, then lastly they would like it to be so buttoned up that it floats well we've seen teslas floating before <laughs> problem is is that they uh, it, it certainly doesn't do them any good and so I think that the interesting thing there is is that it is not only is this doable uh, I think that the other Tesla models will also benefit greatly from them being able to do this to the truck. I think that the things that they learn about sealing up the drive units and sealing up the cabin and the battery uh, I think that uh, uh, existing models of uh, Tesla vehicles will also benefit from what they learn as they move forward to uh, doing that. And uh, I th do think that getting the thing to float is really just a case of sealing up the battery compartment. If you do that, and then again, we're talking about that side entry uh, for, the, for the vehicle, that because there's going to be a step up to get over the battery to get into the vehicle, uh, I think that if you seal up the battery compartment, that this would actually allow the vehicle to be have enough buoyancy to float above the level of that step relatively easy, I think. So that'll be an interesting thing to uh, see. Let me, again, know what you guys think on that. And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about this pulling capacity. Now you'll notice that I revised the terminology. The terminology that Elon Musk used was towing capacity. Now, if I were in this engineering meeting and Elon Musk poked his head in the door and said, oh yeah, hey, by the way, I want the thing to be able to tow 300,000 pounds. Before he would be able to pull his head out of that door, I would say, what are we gonna use for brakes? Because towing isn't just about what you can pull with the thing. It's about what you're going to be able to control with the thing. And there is no way, no way that this thing is going to be able to control 300,000 pounds. That's not happening. And so let's just go ahead and assume that what he meant by that was pulling capacity. Now, we already know how powerful these cars are. And so it's pulling capacity to be able to make itself the best stump remover on the planet isn't actually so much a factor of its motors or its gearing or any of that, though those things are obviously important. It will ultimately be a factor of the way that the towing hitches and the um, towing hooks and any um, eye hooks that you put into the thing, how well those are integrated with the frame structure of the, uh, of the vehicle. Because it's easy for me to see that this thing would have enough torque that when it's trying to pull oh, a tree, that it would have enough torque to actually lift the front wheels off of the ground. And so the attachment 
attachment points need to be such that it will be able to allow the owner to utilize that amount of, of torque. And so I think that that's what we're going to be seeing as far as that 300,000 pounds. Not towing, I, I, I don't know, it'll be interesting to see what the actual tow rating uh, will be on the vehicle, but that will ultimately be a product of the vehicle's weight and how effective its brakes are. Now, one advantage that this will most certainly have over another towing vehicle, and that is the fact that on a downgrade, the upgrade, obviously, that speaks for itself. It, you'll be able to haul anything up a hill. But on the downgrade, that you'll be able to allow the vehicle to regeneratively brake, and provided it doesn't load the hitch too much, in, in braking that the trailer can then share some of that uh, some of that braking load then you'll have a huge advantage over a standard vehicle you'll be able to regain a tremendous amount of of power and now initially there might be some issues because when you do use regenerative braking going down a hill you're generally off of the gas off of the accelerator but you're not on the brake and if you have electric brakes then you're, you're not going to be actuating the brakes on the trailer. If you have a hydraulic braking hitch, then the potential is there that you may wind up losing uh, power that you could actually be gaining as you're going down that hill. And so I can also see eventually that there will be custom trailers that could possibly be designed to work in conjunction with the uh, truck to allow both trailer and truck to be able to regenerate power as they go down the hill. So there's obviously some, some interesting engineering avenues that, that might be um, possible for the, the future. And so then we'll close out this video by talking about the final aspect uh, of the truck, the final engineering demand, that it costs under $50,000. That's a tough one, but as you saw from our quick mock-up that we did for the uh, cab over uh, truck uh, that, that Photoshop mock-up that we have here if this thing has a smaller battery and if the inside is incredibly Spartan then I think they might actually be able to make that price point because they're obviously going to be leveraging motors that they're using in other cars and so that will be a benefit to them and then they'll also be leveraging their battery technology their in-house battery technology hopefully the prices will start to come down on that by the time that we see a release date for the truck coming out uh, 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 I think they're talking about 2022 or 2023 something like that so certainly doable by uh, by that time anything anything can happen so hope you found that interesting and i again i look forward to seeing what your comments are in the regards to our design criteria the uh, reveal is going to be on November the 21st and so we're going to be doing a follow-up to this video where we're going to take a look at all of the comments that have been laid on this video and then we'll take a look at the uh, the comments that were the closest and uh, that were the most supportable by uh, e existing uh, engineering that is available to these uh, uh, to these vehicles that uh, items that were already made by Tesla we'll see how how good the predictions were on which pieces were going to be reused model 3 motors are they going to be using the battery from the Roadster are they going to be using any parts off of the semi so speculate away and then again once they do the actual reveal we'll do a recap of this and see how close everybody was and so again if this is the kind of thing that you enjoy please like and subscribe and i very much look forward to seeing what tesla actually reveals i'm very excited by the new product obviously elon musk is as well he says that this is the best thing that tesla has designed to date so i think the thing is going to be a lot better looking than my Photoshop mock-up, but uh, we'll uh, see 
what they actually reveal. Till next time.